going to talk a little bit about uh, 2016 and beyond. But first, I wanted to ask um, how many people are on their first eclipse trip? On this trip? Oh, maybe, about, maybe about a half, maybe about a third of you. Well, I'm really sorry we didn't have better weather yesterday. Is anybody, did anybody find a location where you saw totality in the corona? Oh, everybody is looking at you with green and his eyes. We had only known. We just moved out of the ship down to the end of the field. Uh, oh, don't make it sound so simple. <laughs> it's always a risk. It's always a gamble. We know when and where the eclipse is going to be, but that old weather gets in there and, and it can snag us up. But for, for those of you who were on your first trip and you didn't get to see the corona, I mean, it was a very, it was a very pretty clouded out eclipse, as far as clouded out eclipses go. And, and I know, and, and a lot of people who talked to me, and that this was their first experience, eclipse experience, they were very excited about seeing the colors and the clouds. And I don't want to diminish your experience at all, but oh my God, did you missed. <laughs> you've got to, don't think you've seen an eclipse now. You've got, put, keep it on your schedule. You've got to go see one in clear sky or at least clear enough that you can get a look at the sun's corona. In fact, a number of us who have seen eclipses before right now are going through, who were with, clouded out yesterday, going through some, some amount of withdrawal. <laughs> so I think, I think for those of us in that category, we need to at least look at one eclipse that was successful. So I'm gonna show very briefly some images of an eclipse uh, back in 2008. Um, and this went through uh, uh, Siberia and uh, Mongolia and China. Um, I was in northern China, where the eclipse lasted uh, a little over, uh, little over a, a minute and a half, or almost two minutes. And uh, this is the usual kind of equipment I bring on a trip, uh, quite a bit. I, I was very uh, carried much less on this particular. Uh, trip because of the nature of it uh, and the location that we were going. But uh, when I can, and when weather prospects look very promising, I'll bring quite a bit more telescopes with me. Um, this is an image, a wide angle image, uh, just as totality is beginning with the diamond ring. This was a very low altitude sun. It was only about uh, uh, nine degrees, 10 degrees above the horizon. And because of that, you could really see the shadow well uh, moving across the horizon towards us. Um, can we can we turn the lights off here? I think these pictures will show up better. Thank you. That's great. <coughs> and here's a little time lapse video. The shadow is going to come in from the right to the left, and you can see it move across the sky there. Um, that's uh, Venus right there. show it one more time really quickly. <coughs> of course, one of the reasons you have to keep shooting eclipses is not only because of the weather and the circumstances, but our cameras keep getting better. Now, back in those days, HD was, was very difficult and, and hard and expensive. And now, HD cameras are fantastic. You can stick them in your pocket, get fantastic quality video. I was hoping to shoot some HD video yesterday. It uh, didn't happen. Um, but uh, this is going into totality, the diamond ring, uh, breaking up into Bailey's beads here. The last beads shining through the deepest mountain valleys along the edge of the moon disappearing and then we've got totality with the corona visible. And some video. Telescope filters off. 50 seconds. Shout out to the north west. 30 seconds. 25. Totality! <laughs> 
can see the chromosphere, that red glow of the sun's um, bottom of the corona, this chromos red chromosphere. Looks like you can't and there's a, a nice prominence the over there that's partly <coughs> covered by the moon. It's going to become uncovered as we go through the calendar. We jump 30 seconds ahead now. See Mercury? And you can see how much more of that prominence is visible. Look at the horizon. Look at the horizon. 25 seconds. Oh, look how bright it's getting. Look at the shape of the shadow cone. Do you see it? See it? See that V over there? 15 seconds. Chromosphere. 10 seconds. Chromosphere. 5 o'clock. See that, Jake? Oh, my God. Here it comes. Here it comes. Feeds. Bailey's beats. Take pictures. Take pictures. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> and one last shot there. That's the Bailey's beads at, at third contact and a close up of that nice prominence up there. And the third contact diamond ring is there. The shadow moves away. Oh, I feel a little better now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk about various types of eclipses and then take a look at what's coming up in the future. Of course, a total eclipse, or any kind of an eclipse, can only happen during the new moon phase. But at most new moons, the moon's shadow passes either above the plane of the Earth or below the plane of the Earth. And the moon's two shadows, the the umbral shadow or the penumbral shadow miss the Earth entirely. But at least twice a year, some part of those shadows hit the Earth and produce an eclipse. Now notice in this case, this is a partial eclipse. The penumbra is hitting the Earth, but not the umbra. And it's only hitting the northern hemisphere. So in this case, North America is getting a, a partial eclipse, but not South America. So they're very localized, these eclipses. And of course, the the umbra is much smaller than the penumbra, so it's, lo it's, it's located at a much smaller part of, of Earth's surface. But that's the type of an eclipse we're interested in, not the partials, but the central eclipses, when that central shadow hits the Earth. Of course, there are three basic central types of eclipses. There are totals, annulars, and hybrid eclipses. Now the reason that now the totals are the ones we're most interested in because that is when you get to see the spectacular halo of the sun's outer atmosphere, the solar corona, this, this two million to four million degree plasma that's twisted and distorted by the magnetic fields of the sun into these beautiful streamers and the helmets and structures that you see. Annular eclipses, although they're interesting, they don't allow you to see the corona. Here's a, a, a time sequence of three images uh, taken of uh, an eclipse in 1994, uh, an annular eclipse, um, five minutes apart. You can see how quickly the moon is moving with respect to the sun. But during the central phase, that ring of sunlight is so bright that it does not darken the sky. It does not allow you to see the corona. In fact, Without some kind of solar filters, you may not even know that the eclipse is taking place. Even this one was about 92% of the sun covered, but even if it's 99 or 99.5%, that thin ring is so incredibly bright, it obscures the corona from view. It's got to be total. The reason why we have annular and hybrid eclipses and total eclipses that change is because the moon orbits the Earth in an elliptical orbit. Earth's orbit is also elliptical, and that plays into this as well, but the ellipticity of Earth's orbit is much smaller. It has a smaller effect than the moon's orbit, because the moon's distance varies by 14% <coughs> between perigee, when it's closest to the Earth, and apogee, when it's most distant. And that 14% means that at some points along the moon's orbit, the moon appears smaller than the sun and can't completely cover it. And we get 
an annular eclipse at that time. And at other times when it's near the perigee side of its orbit, it's big enough to cover the sun and we get a total eclipse. And if we look at all, all types of central eclipses, these are the proportions that we get. 51% of all central eclipses are annular, 41 are total, and 8% are hybrid. If we look at the statistics of partial eclipses as well, and look at a big 5,000 year chunk from 2000 BCE to 3000 CE, that cons constitutes almost 12,000 solar eclipses in 5,000 years. Then we find that 35% are partial, 32 are annular, 27 about are total, and just about 5% are these hybrid eclipses. So I'm gonna talk about some of the different types of uh, 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 central eclipses that are taking place in the next few years, but I'm gonna concentrate on totals. I'm gonna show some of the annulars just for completeness, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on the annulars per se, because they don't allow us to see the corona, and that's what we're really interested in, the, the corona and the darkness of totality. <coughs> so the first thing coming up in a year from now is a total eclipse, um, this blue track here, that passes through Sumatra and Indonesia, and as luck would have it, as is often the case, most of the path is across open ocean. What a waste of an eclipse. <laughs> uh, in this, and in this particular case, uh, this also happens to be during uh, one of the wetter seasons um, in the, that part of the world. So the weather prospects next year um, are a little better than here, but not tremendously better. It's not going to be cold, it's going to be hot and cloudy instead of cold and cloudy. <laughs> hopefully. Hope, hope, I mean, hopefully not. Hopefully one finds the right place where the weather cooperates um, and you're, you're able to see the eclipse. Um, I'm, I'm actually already working with, uh, uh, on, on uh, planning on going to a location right between Borneo and Celebes um, with the Spears Travel. Um, so if you're giving some thought to going to the eclipse next year, uh, I'd love to have you join us. But um, it is a long way to go, and the weather prospects are not as good as we would like them to be. But coming up is a better option. This one, this one is, as I said, uh, I'm going to show you all the centrals that are taking place. This one's an annular <coughs> through Africa. Um, followed six months later by another annular eclipse. This one goes through South America and Africa. What's interesting about this one is it's very short, only 44 seconds. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, and that means 99.2% of the sun's disk will be uh, uh, occluded by the moon, still you cannot see the corona as an eclipse, even though, this, even though almost all of the sun is covered. Still that eight-tenths of a percent is enough not to allow you to see the corona. But after that, here's the next really big, best opportunity for a total eclipse, <coughs> really, in the next half a dozen years. And that's the, the August 21st eclipse in 2017, passing right across the United States Excuse me, during the middle of summer. I have a question. The uh, greatest eclipse uh, would that be in an area with a good uh, weather prospect? Um, greatest, well, greatest, greatest eclipse, um, which is this little star on here. Greatest yeah. eclipse um, is the instant when the axis of the moon's shadow passes closest to the center of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So eclipse predictors use this as, if you've got to describe the eclipse by a particular time or date, they use the instant of greatest eclipse. It's easy to easy to calculate. Yeah. It's that instant. Well, now you were asking about the weather. Yeah, uh, I'll get area. to that. Okay, I'll get to that. <coughs> Can I just ask a question? So you, yeah. you've got the, the little star saying the greatest eclipse. The other one further down is that subsolar or something? That one is subsolar. I've never understood what that means. I'll tell you what it means. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people ask me that. Um, this map is, is generated, or uh, the orientation, Ac actually there, there's a bit of a terminator, the, the, the line between day and night, 
you can barely see it on this particular diagram. But that terminator, that instant, is drawn for the instant of greatest eclipse. And at that instant, if you were at the subsolar point, the sun would be directly overhead. It really doesn't have anything to do with the eclipse per se. It's just that's the point on Earth where the sun is directly overhead. The subsolar point, you're underneath the, bar, the sun. It's directly in the zenith. So that's what the subsolar point means. Sometimes it's in the eclipse path, in this case in the partial zone. Sometimes it's outside of the complete zone. So it's just that region where the sun is overhead. Okay, now, this, this path, uh, 2017, cuts right across the, U the U.S. It goes through Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Kansas. That's the western U.S. going to the eastern U.S. It continues on through Mississippi, uh, Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, and Tennessee, a little bit of Georgia, a little <coughs> bit of North Carolina, and South Carolina before sweeping out across the Atlantic. So there's a lot of real estate to pick from here. Um, you'll notice that Kansas City is right on the edge of the eclipse path. St. Louis, the southern suburbs are, are inside the eclipse path. Omaha is right there. So there are some, some cities in the middle of the country with big inter international airports that it's easy to get to. I'm not suggesting you watch the eclipse from them, but it's good, easy to get to the eclipse path. Now, um, how many people have ever heard of this new website, EclipseWise? Nobody. Well, you hear about it now. Uh, because it's a new website that I, I started uh, just recently. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, and um, this is an example from EclipseWise, this, this uh, web page. It's a Google map with the eclipse path drawn on it. And uh, if you click on it with your mouse, a window pops open that tells you the eclipse times in Universal uh, for that particular location. So you've got the Universal time, the altitude and azimuth of the sun, the duration of totality, and you can zoom into the map just like any any Google map and click on it. You can click in the eclipse path, outside of the eclipse path, any particular location, and we'll calculate the eclipse times for that location. You can see the highway structure. So this is useful for planning uh, where to go, what the escape routes are, what, what locations to go to. And uh, you can find this map by going to EclipseWise 2017 Total Solar Eclipse. If there's Google app, it's probably one of the links will come up for that. But I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Weather. Someone asked about the weather. Yeah. This is Jay Anderson's uh, diagram. And <clears throat> to make a long story short, the weather prospects are better in the western half of the U.S. than they are in the eastern. That's a very broad, sweeping uh, generalization. <clears throat> because the fact of the matter is, no matter where you go in along that eclipse path, on some days it's cloudy and some days it's clear. It's just a little more frequent in the western side of the country. Uh, I think a more interesting diagram that, that Jay produced is, is this one. So this takes you from the western end of the eclipse path across the United States to the eastern along the central line of the eclipse. And what we're seeing here is the amount of cloudiness as you go across the eclipse path. And in this diagram, low amounts are low amounts of clouds. So you want something low. You don't want something high. That's high amounts of clouds. So you can see that the lowest values are down here on the western side of the country <coughs> as opposed to the eastern side. Now, an in interesting thing about this particular <coughs> diagram is it shows this strange oscillation. What is going on there? You're going over, mount you're going over the Rocky Mountains, mm -hmm. up and down, over the ranges. And when you're on the western side of the ranges, the weather prospects get bad because you've got the weather systems coming from the west with moisture. They rise up into the mountains and they form more tendency to form clouds. When they, when the air, when you get onto the eastern side, you're in the wind shadow. It's drier on the eastern side of the mountains. So that's what's going on on these things. And again, this is all long-term climate. On, on uh, eclipse day, it could be perfectly clear over here and cloudy over there. 
there's a, some, always some gamble involved with it. But I think, especially for this particular eclipse, the, the I'm not going to tell you where the best place is to go. Oh. <laughs> if, and I wish I knew. <laughs> but I think the best strategy is pick a part of the U.S. that you'd like to visit. <laughs> Yellowstone or Knoxville, Tennessee, your country western span, whatever. Pick a place you'd like to go. Visit there. <clears throat> have your rental car. Two days before the eclipse, get on in the internet. See, because the weather forecasting is, is quite good when you're 36 hours out, 48 hours out. See what big weather fronts are coming through, or whether there's a we're, we're praying for a huge high system that covers the whole U.S. But if there's a low system moving through, you want to be on the other side of that where the good weather is coming. Get in the car and go. That's the best way to really optimize your chances. Because this long-term, you know, picking one place because it's five percent better than the other it is is nonsense. Pick some place you want to visit, and then be mobile, be ready to move in that last day or two before the eclipse. <coughs> If you do something like that, it, it's it's your best uh, best option for. Uh, there's no guarantee, but it's your closest thing to a guarantee of being able to see the eclipse, unless there's some god awful hurricane system covering the whole U.S. and we're yeah. all wiped out. Unlikely, not impossible. That's not the tornado season or anything like that. Is it? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. The tornado season, I think, really is more uh, more in the spring, in, in the middle of the country, in the middle of the country. It is very early in the hurricane season, wow. which is in the fall. But that that tends to hit the east coast, uh, the east coast mainly. But yeah, you got to look out for stuff like that. Keep your eyes open on, on what the weather is doing. Now, for Oh, 15 years or more, Jay Anderson and I produced a series of eclipse bulletins um, through NASA. Um, but those uh, bulletins terminated when Jay and I retired. Uh, and it's taken us a few years to figure out how to do this without, without government funding. But I'm happy to say that we are now working on uh, a bulletin for the 2017 eclipse, which is is uh, I was hoping to have it done before this trip, not quite finished. So as soon as I get home, I've got to get back to work on it. Uh, just to give you a little, a little teaser, um, that's one of the maps from the bulletin. Uh, and, and the bulletin is going to be in full color. And this is the path um, through Nebraska and Kansas. And you can see we've got drawn here the durations of totality, 30 seconds, 60, 90, 120. 150, and then the central line. You've got all your ho your highways and roadways. You can see where uh, where uh, logistically you you have roads that you can easily drive to move around during the eclipse path. Um, so that's just an example of uh, what's going to be in the bulletin. And I'm I'm going to be as soon as I get home, I have to go to work to get this finished by the end of April, early May at the very latest. Um, and you'll be able to find it by going to astropixels.com slash pubs. Uh, and probably after a couple of weeks, you might be able to Google it initially. You'll have to look for it that way. Well, after 2017, uh, there are no central eclipses in 2018, only partials. The next central eclipse is in 2019. Uh, it's uh, in uh, South America again, uh, uh, or South America, but in this case, most of that eclipse path is over the ocean. Another waste of an eclipse track. Why didn't that go through some easily accessible part of the world? Uh, nevertheless, uh, it does go through Argentina and Chile down here. Um, it is during their winter, so I'm not quite sure what the weather prospects are for that yet. I'll have to look into that. But it's a fairly long eclipse. It, the maximum is four minutes and 33 seconds. Of course, that's out here in the ocean, so it'll be shorter when we get here, but probably still over three minutes by the time it reaches uh, Chile and Argentina. Um, after July 2019, we, six months later, there's an annular eclipse um, through Southeast uh, Asia again, through uh, Indonesia and uh, India. 
followed six months later by another annular eclipse, uh, this time uh, through Africa, Southern Asia. The interesting thing about this one is that at greatest eclipse out over here, it's only 30 sec 38 seconds long. And you would think, wow, can you see the corona during a real short annular eclipse? The, I don't know if you can, some of you might not be able to see it. The magnitude of this eclipse, the fraction of the sun's <coughs> diameter compared to the moon's. The moon will cover 99.4% of the sun's diameter. And just that six tenths of 1% will mean that that exceedingly thin annular ring is still much too bright. You still will not be able to see the corona during that eclipse. Uh, be interesting eclipse to see, uh, but uh, no corona really. So great Bailey's beads. Finally, 2020, we get another total eclipse. And once again, this one goes through South America, again, through Chile and Argentina. But this time, it's during summer. And the point of greatest eclipse goes right through South America. Um, if, you were, if you were at this little location, uh, the duration would be two minutes and 10 seconds. Uh, and the sun would be 73 degrees above the horizon. So quite high in the sky. Mm -hmm. And I think that looks like the most promising eclipse after the 2017 in the US. So if you think you only want to go to South America once, and you're looking at 2019 and 2020, hello, hello. I would pick 2020. I come up in reception. There to forward. This annular eclipse I'm going to say a couple words about on 2020. Um, this one starts right near the, the U.S. Canadian border at sunrise and uh, sweeps across uh, the North Pole and uh, ends over in <coughs> Siberia. The interesting thing about this eclipse is this end of it down here. It's right near the summer solstice. Um, the weather in Canada that time of year is probably the most favorable time to do something like this. And it's true there will be no corona to see, but sunrise or sunset annulars are interesting for another reason. They're very photogenic subjects. <laughs> this was the annular eclipse in the U.S. back in uh, 2012, uh, and this was photographed from uh, New Mexico just a few minutes after the annular phase. You get that very very extended crescent as the sun was setting behind a, a wind turbine field. So they're very, very photogenic subjects, in spite of nothing. Okay, but we're looking for total eclipses. Now this one's going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> because we're going through Antarctica down here. Um, South America is right here, and most of the trips, the ship trips to Antarctica, Leave, leave from southern, uh, su southern uh, South America right here down to the peninsula. So you're getting into that right part of the world. You're not quite in the eclipse path. And I'm sure some, eclipse, some um, Antarctica uh, outfitters that organize these trips to Antarctica will, will arrange some type of eclipse cruises. But there's no question about it. It's going to be an expensive trip and a difficult trip to get to. And probably not the greatest weather prospects, because that part of the world is very subject to, to change, even though it's that high summer down there. Well, for um, almost 20 years, um, I've been running the NASA Eclipse website. I started it in 1996. And in fact, when I started it, this is before NASA had any website policies, or the government hadn't gotten into into full gear on, on controlling stuff like this. So I just started running this from a laptop computer in my office for the first year or two. Um, but after that, it, it, the, the, the viewership expanded, and we had to put it on bigger servers to keep up with the demand. Um, the problem with this website is that um, over the years, it grew piecemeal. I'd get an idea, and I'd add some new feature, and then. It, year later something else would be added and, and there was no big overviewing design or organization of the website as things developed on it. 
And the other problem that I had was occasionally things would happen with the government, like um, like Congress wouldn't pass funding, and the government <coughs> would shut down for a month. You couldn't get to the website because they'd shut down the servers. And that was frustrating. And I decided uh, a year or so ago that I wanted to um, set up a mirror site of the NASA site, run by run outside of government control, so if the government went down, I'd still have the website available. <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the more I decided not to have a mirroring website, to develop new material on this, and really redesign the whole website uh, in a much more organized fashion, um, with, with the hindsight of being able to see the features that I had on the NASA site. So EclipseWise went online just a few months ago in October. Um, it's got a, 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 a very new design and layout compared to the NASA site. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. And although the NASA site is going to continue, I don't know how long it's going to continue, because it's not in my control anymore now that I'm retired, um, they could decide tomorrow to yank the site and take it down. Or it could be up there for 20 years, I don't know. Um, but Eclipse-wise, is in my control, and I'm a control freak, so I like that. <laughs> I'm in full control of that. And all the future predictions and uh, future Eclipse material that I pr prepare are going to go on Eclipse-wise. The NASA site is just going to be sort of an archive of the state of what was there at the end of 2014. I'm really not going to be adding new material to that. It's going to go on Eclipse-wise. So you want to change your bookmarks from the NASA site to Eclipse-wise. Let me introduce you to one of one of a, a, a typical page that's on Eclipse-wise. This is the page for the August 21st eclipse in 2017, and the layout of all of many many pages is very similar to this. There's an overview map of the eclipse on one side here, and then there's a description of the eclipse here with various uh, parameters listed here. All the red, of course, are links to define any kinds of terms. And then there's some important links down at the bottom that you guys in the back can't see, but we'll get to them. If you click on the map, you get a, a, a blow up of it. That gives you an idea of the, of the level of detail. It's a good schematic that shows you the basic regions of where uh, the, the zones of visibility are. Uh, these curves are 20%, so that's an 80% eclipse, 64, uh, no, 25%. So that's 75, 50, um, 25, and zero. And then, of course, the central path. If you go back, uh, there are also links to those Google Maps with the eclipse path plotted on it. So you can click on the path and get circumstance times for any location in the eclipse path. There are links to go to a table of coordinates, which gives you information about the sun's altitude and the azimuth and the duration of totality every two minutes along the entire eclipse path. There's a link to the Saros table for that particular eclipse. It belongs to Saros 145. You can go uh, to the 145 table and look up previous eclipses in that Saros series and see how they compare. All of that material is accessed through links down at the bottom here, directly from this page. This page, uh, and if you scroll down that page, you will find probably much more information about the eclipse than you really want to know. <laughs> there are details about some of the parameters, the, the, great, the eclipse magnitude, the eclipse obscuration, a parameter called gamma, which des describes how far the axis of the shadow passes with respect to the center of the Earth. There's information about conjunction times of, of the moon and the sun, the coordinates of the moon and the sun at, the, at greatest eclipse, information about the moon's vibration or wobbling during the eclipse. Um, a lot more information, uh, it's probably eight or ten different tables. Uh, one table I'll call your attention to is a table that lists the polynomial Besselian elements. Everything about the eclipse can be calculated with this very brief set of numbers. And these are the numbers I've calculated for this particular eclipse. 
If you happen to have a piece of software where you can input the bazillion elements, you can take these elements off this page and plug it into your software and know that you're using the same numbers that I'm using for calculating stuff on, on the Eclipse. So all of that stuff is listed as you scroll down this, this main page for the 2017 Eclipse. And I call this page a prime page for the 2017 Eclipse. A solar eclipse prime page. Now, the period from minus 1999 or, or 2000 BCE to 3000 AD, there are 11,898 solar eclipses <coughs> during a 5,000-year period. On eclipse-wise, I have a prime page just like this page I've outlined for every single eclipse over that 5,000 years. Each page has a global map for the eclipse. It's got a Google map for the central eclipses, central path of the coordinates, Saros table, Basilian elements, contact times for the shadow, all that same information that you saw for the 2017 is available for all the eclipses during that 5,000 year period through links on the prime page for that eclipse. Similar sort of thing for lunar eclipses. Not nearly as spectacular, but visible from much larger uh, parts of the world. Um, for those of you in, in Europe and the United Kingdom, uh, there's a lunar eclipse, a total lunar eclipse coming in September, six months from now. Uh, and uh, the prime page has information about that uh, and a lot of links to other information about the eclipse and a lot of those types of tables. And again, it covers that same 5,000 year period. So there's a prime page for every lunar eclipse which amounts to 12,064 prime pages for every single lunar eclipse during that interval. It took me a while to calculate and generate all this stuff, <laughs> you might imagine. So, how do you navigate around on Eclipse-wise? How do you access all these prime pages? How do you find them? Well, the basic organization of Eclipse-wise is that there are three top pages. The first very top page is the page for solar and lunar eclipses. When you just type in eclipsewise.com, that's where it's gonna take you, to the solar and lunar eclipse page. I'll show you what that looks like. <clears throat> there are two other top pages. The solar and lunar give you a mixture of both solar and lunar eclipses. The solar page is strictly solar eclipses and the lunar is strictly lunar. What are they, uh, oh, and each of these in turn the solar link to all of those 11,000 plus prime pages. The lunar links to those 12,000 prime pages. And even from the top solar and lunar eclipse, there are links to the prime pages. This is what they look like. Let's go to the top page here, the solar and lunar page. When you go onto Eclipse-wise, what you see is Year by year, this is 2014, 2015, and it ticks off each eclipse, solar and lunar, in chronological order during that year. Click on any of the first, you get a nice little thumbnail to see where the eclipse is visible. If it's someplace in, that you'd like to go or in your region of the world, you want to know more about it, click on that link. It takes you directly <coughs> to the prime page with all that other information about the eclipse. There's a link up here for the solar eclipses page and the lunar eclipses page, if you want to go to either one of those and look at those in more detail. Here's what the solar eclipse, top solar eclipse page looks like. Here it just has a continuous list of eclipses for the next uh, eight or ten years. And I'll update that every year or so to take 2014 out and put 2015 through 2023, for instance. But again, you click on any of this, these links, it will take you to the prime page for that eclipse. Lunar eclipses, same thing. You've got a, a quick thumbnail of what type of an eclipse it is, which region of the world it's visible from, and click on it to get to the prime page to, to find out more about that particular eclipse. <coughs> All of these diagrams, and a lot of the content from Eclipse-wise, was inspired by the thousand-year canon the solar eclipses that I just published last year, and the, the thousand year canon of lunar eclipses. In fact, the diagrams that appear in these books, these two books, are the same diagrams that are on eclipse walls. 
they've got quite a bit more detail than similar diagrams that I had done on the NASA website. The Thousand Year Cannon has uh, 2,389 solar eclipse maps and related data. The lunar cannon, the corresponding lunar cannon, has a few more that has 2,424 lunar eclipses with uh, 12 diagrams per, per page. But all of those diagrams helped inspire and were involved in the design of Eclipse Wise. I was doing them, I started the books first and, and then I decided to just use the same material on Eclipse Wise. Another feature that's on Eclipse Wise, and this is also on the NASA site, um, but I've got a, um, a um, 5,000 year atlas of eclipse paths. So this is annular, total, and hybrid eclipses. Um, this is for the 20 year period, 2001 through 2020. Um, the red paths are annular eclipses, the blue ones are totals. But this gives us the 20 year um, uh, period that we're in right now. Um, the, the, the fun thing about doing something, and you can, it's broken up into 20 year chunks, so you can look at any period from 2000 BCE to 3000 CE. Uh, and pick any period in time and look at the eclipse paths. But contemporary eclipses right now, one interesting thing is to zoom in on one particular part of the world, and since a good fraction of, uh, oh, you can find this on eclipse wise, there are links almost on every page. That'll, that down at the bottom that'll take, take you to the Atlas of Eclipse, Eclipse Paths, World Atlas. Or you can just Google it, Eclipse Wise, <coughs> Eclipse World Atlas. Um, but one of the fun things is to just to zoom in on one part of the world and look at the progression of eclipses in one geographic area. So this is the period from 2001 to 2020 in Europe. And uh, here's a, an annular eclipse that I'm sure some people in the audience saw in 2003 that was visible from Iceland and uh, northern uh, Scotland. Um, here is yesterday's eclipse <coughs> map. There are the Faroe Islands right there. Um, there was an eclipse that passed through uh, Libya and the edge of Egypt and in through Turkey in 2006, um, which uh, I'm sure some people uh, visited. Uh, there was an, uh, an annular eclipse through uh, Madrid in 2005. So that's all past material. Let's look ahead to the next 20 years, 2021 to 2040. And we do have a total eclipse going through Europe, goes through the edge of Iceland, and basically through uh, cent north central Spain and into the Mediterranean. This is the sunset part of the eclipse path down here. Um, we've also got, that was that's in August 2026, which, hey, that's only 11 years from now. That's not too, too long to wait. Um, there's another uh, you, nice eclipse path right down here that's just a year later in 2027. And this is a member of my favorite Cero series. This is a member of Cero's 136, that wonderful series that produces very long total solar eclipses. It produced the 1991 through Mexico and Hawaii, the 2009 through uh, China, and now the 2027. This will produce a total eclipse lasting more than six minutes in, in, uh, in um, Egypt. Who knows what the politics is going to be like in, in 11 years. Uh, I, I still can't believe that we were able to go to Libya in 2006. There was such a very narrow political window when, at least for Americans, we weren't even able to, uh, we weren't even politically allowed to go to Libya until sometime in 2005. Um, and then by 2010, 2011, that window closed, and I wouldn't dare go back there now. Um, but um, it's it's a it's a great eclipse covering quite a quite a bit of territory to get to, uh, and uh, everybody's going to want to be going to that one because it's such a long eclipse, and the weather prospects along here are very good, very dry. Interesting annular coming up here through through um, through. Um, uh, Spain again. Normally, it wouldn't be worth <coughs> traveling far for an annular eclipse, but here's a here's a chance for for one of those sunset annulars, right there. Okay. Well, now we're getting into the into the range of of fiction, 
because a lot of us aren't going to be around by 2041 to 2060. Um, and there aren't a lot of good eclipses during that 20 year period, at least for, uh, for uh, Europe and uh, Northern Africa. 2053 uh, through Gibraltar and again through Libya and uh, Egypt. Uh, 2060 over here through Turkey. Twenty sixty one over here in Asia. Uh, no good totals in twenty sixty one to twenty eighty. Finally, twenty eighty one to twenty one hundred. We've got some great eclipses. That's the good news. <laughs> oh, I wish I had a time machine <laughs> or a fountain of youth or something. Twenty ninety. There's a wonderful eclipse coming through England and France. Another one uh, nine years earlier in 2081, and another eclipse in 2088. So in the span of, of nine years, there are three wonderful total eclipses. Write some letters to your great-great-grandchildren to open in, in, the eight, in the 2070s to put those on their calendar. So those are the kind of things, even though none of us will be around for those, they're, they're fun to look at, at least I think they're fun to look at, future and past eclipses. And uh, that just gives you a little taste of, of some of the things, some of the things in the near future and the far future, and uh, an idea of how to look up some of this stuff um, through both the NASA site and EclipseWise. So thank you very much.